William Marbury was the guy who got a, a commission to be justice of the peace. And uh, the justice of the peace was created by a federal statute passed by the Federalist Party during the lame duck session. Uh, one of the things they did, uh, which irritated Jefferson, was to create a number of uh, justice of the peace ships, 42 in number for the District of Columbia. Uh, William Marbury was one of the recipients of these commissions for the justice of the peace, which by the way was, was not a major office. It was an office supported entirely by fees, but still it was important to William Marbury. The problem was that uh, these commissions, although they were signed by President John Adams, they, uh, an act passed by Congress, signed by the president, presumably bestowed this office on William Marbury. The problem was, even though the commissions were signed and sealed, so to speak, they were never delivered. And when uh, the new government took over, when Jefferson and took over and Madison as the Secretary of State, these commissions were still on the Secretary of State's desk, undelivered. And because uh, Jefferson felt this was an act of, you know, uh, political vengeance, so to speak, he decided not to deliver all of them, although he did deliver some of them. William Marbury's was not among the commissions that w were delivered. And what, what William Mar Marbury did was to hire a lawyer, Charles Lee, and take it to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, of course, was presided over by the new Chief Justice, uh, John Marshall, who, by the way, was Secretary of the State, acting Secretary of the State, who didn't deliver the commissions. So the case was, you might say, loaded politically from the beginning. It was a, another example of this ongoing warfare between two cousins, uh, John Marshall and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, it was a sort of head-to-head -head combat because Jefferson instructed Madison not to deliver Marbury's uh, commission, and uh, the case went to the Supreme Court uh, on original jurisdiction. That is to say, it went directly uh, to the Supreme Court, not from a lower court, but directly to the Supreme Court under original jurisdiction. Original jurisdiction was defined by uh, Article Three of the Constitution, so it was a constitutionally mandated process, which turned out to be the, uh, a major problem. So this generated a case which lasted from 18.1 to 18.3 and uh, uh, resulted in Marshall's great famous statement about judicial review. So uh, the problem with this case, however, is that it's extremely complex. And, and the, the fact is that it's a widely misunderstood opinion, even though it was one of Marshall's major opinions. So why was it, why was it misunderstood? The way it's taught in law schools, and I think probably in most history courses, uh, is to teach it as the ultimate statement, uh, the final statement on the court's power to review acts of Congress which are in conflict with the Constitution, which, of course, by Article VI is the supreme law of the land. Uh, so Marshall is given credit with kind of creating judicial review. This is all, now I wouldn't say all wrong, but there's a lot of it that's wrong. For example, I mean, judicial review, the idea that the Supreme Court can apply a, a constitutional uh, mandate to lower legislative acts, either at the state level or the federal level, was not new at all. There were at least 24 examples of state courts declaring unconstitutional state laws that violated state constitutions. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the Supreme Court of the United States, in the case of Hilton versus United States, had already exercised judicial review over acts of Congress, although in the Hilton case, the court upheld the questionable act. Nevertheless, it presumably would have struck it down had it been unconstitutional. So, to credit Marshall with a great the creation of the idea that uh, legislation is under the control of constitutions is, is uh, a misunderstanding. What makes it such a, an important case, however, is that it is, first of all, the first time that the Supreme Court has 
actually declared an act of Congress unconstitutional before it had exercised the authority, but had not exactly uh, implemented it. The other thing was, of course, that it was a decided victory for the integrity of the Supreme Court as against the executive. And so it becomes not just a judicial review question, in my opinion, but it also becomes one of the major uh, fundamental propositions in separation of powers. And I think that is, th is the true issue. So in the middle of this case, Marshall gives it his cousin, President Jefferson, a lecture on the separation of powers. And what he said was basically this. Hey, you want to give a guy a commission? You got the right to, to choose whoever you want to give a commission to, right? That's a political act, and the court cannot question the political authority of the president to do that. But he also said, once that commission is created, it has the force of a legal contract. A piece of property was bestowed. It's not a big deal, but for William Marbury, it may have been a big deal. But the law allows Marbury a remedy for uh, his deprivation of property, that is to say the failure to deliver the commission. And so what Marbury was asking the court to do, what Marbury's lawyer Charles Lee was asking the court to do, was to issue a so-called writ of mandamus, which is a prerogative, old common law prerogative writ, which, by which a Supreme Court can uh, issue an order to a lower court to follow the law, basically. Uh, the, the writ of mandamus, presumably, according to Lee's argument, was given in Section 13 of the Judiciary Act of 1789. The Judiciary Act, certainly one of the great pieces of legislation in American history, created the whole structure of lower federal courts and bestowed on those courts certain powers. And it appeared from Section 13 that in cases of original jurisdiction, the court had the right to issue a writ of mandamus. The problem is, however, and, and this is what Charles Lee argued, by the way, that Section 13 did allow the Supreme Court, in cases brought directly before it under original jurisdiction, did allow the court to issue writs of mandamus. So, I mean, this was, this was the issue. Could the court, could Marshall's court, actually issue this writ, forcing Secretary of State Madison to deliver uh, William Marbury's commission? Well, it looked like a situation fraught with disaster. Uh, if Marshall said, yes, the court has a right to issue the mandamus to the President of the United States, or rather his Secretary of State, ordering him to do something, almost certainly this Secretary of State would refuse uh, because he was ordered by President not to, to deliver the writ. So that would have repudiated, that at the very threshold would have repudiated, repudiated the court's authority. Um, it, it looked like an impossible no-win situation for Marshall. So what he did was, in a sense, uh, uh, it's what makes the case so in incredibly unique and, and intriguing because it reveals Marshall's uh, dexterity, I guess you might say, both his political and legal dexterity. So he reversed the order of questions, um, uh, saving the, the jurisdictional question, that is to say, the question of whether the court really did have the authority under Section 13 to issue the writ. He reserved that to the very end. And so what he did it was to say, uh, does Marbury have the right to this writ? Yeah, he does. Because after all, it was issued, signed and sealed by the President of the United States, sure. If he has a right to the writ, is there a legal remedy to that right? And Marshall said, yeah. And then the third question was, uh, is a writ of mandamus issuing from the Supreme Court of the United States to the Secretary of State the proper remedy? And it was here that Marshall uh, sort of saved himself from disaster, you might say, saved the court from disaster, and established uh, 
uh, helped establish the doctrine of judicial review. What he said was, Congress has no authority, as in Section 13 of the Judiciary Act, has no authority to extend and define original jurisdiction. Original jurisdiction is dealt with only on the constitutional level in Article Three. For Congress to do this is a violation, in a sense, of the Constitution. And so, Marshall de declared Section 13 unconstitutional. That is to say, he exercised judicial review, which had been exercised before, except now that he actually declared an act of Congress unconstitutional. And, uh, you know, under these trying circumstances, I mean, it was a huge institutional victory because it consolidated what had been understood before uh, as a right of the court. As a matter of fact, Alexander Hamilton, in a famous Federalist number 78, had talked about judicial review. What Marshall did, however, was to, in this case, was to make it a reality. Uh, people have argued, scholars have argued, that he took considerable liberties to do this. I mean, the argument is, hey, look, if the court didn't have jurisdiction, why didn't Marshall just say so to start with? But of course, that was not his point. But the main thing, I think, to, be, to keep in mind is that this was not just an exercise of judicial review, but it was an exercise of separation of powers at a very critical moment in American constitutional history. The relationship of the three branches of government simply had not been defined up to that point. It was a work in progress. What Marshall did in this case was to insist on the legal authority of the court. In other words, he defined the court as a legal institution, not a political institution. A, a legal institution which was separate from uh, the political branch of government. They were two different branches of government. So if you look at it as a separation of powers question, which I think one should, uh, it's the beginning of a kind of a fundamental institutional definition of the meaning of separation of powers in the Constitution, which makes it not just a judicial review question, but a, a fundamental uh, constitutional issue, which, which Marshall settles here. The one other thing about it, I think, needs to be remembered. Just because Marshall said the court has the right to declare acts unconstitutional, as he said, it's emphatically the duty of the, of the Supreme Court to say what the law is. By the way, that's not original with Marshall. I mean, uh, Marshall took that from Blackstone's uh, uh, Tenth Rule of Statutory Construction, uh, you know, by the way, which illustrates the importance of the common law uh, in Marshall's interpretive strategy. But again, it, it's the way Marshall avoided a conflict with the president that he was bound to lose, the way he asserted judicial review and reaffirmed the difference between the executive branch, which is political, and the court, Supreme Court, which is legal. So in all these ways, it was a foundational moment. The one final thing to keep in mind is that the potential of, of Marbury had not been tested, really. Uh, judicial review and separation of powers was a work in progress. And if Marshall had not succeeded in making good on the meaning of judicial review, which he did in the great cases like McCulloch or Gibbons uh, or the Cherokee cases, judicial review wouldn't have amounted to anything. In other words, it's when he pointed out that the key to judicial review, it's not just saying yes or no to acts of Congress, but it's giving a reasoned explanation for his decision. And in that reasoned explanation, Marshall allows himself really to say what the Constitution means. And it's this ability to provide a reasoned justification that distinguishes the Supreme Court from the political branches in a, in a fundamental way. I mean, the court gets to, to say what the Constitution means. It goes down into the Supreme Court reports which generations of scholars and lawyers and judges can read. This is never true of an act of Congress or an executive action. I mean, Marshall claims some high ground for the court in judicial review. It's a process that began in Marbury, but it didn't end there. Well, Aaron Burr was uh, 
a fascinating, uh, uh, incomprehensible figure in American history. He was, he was certainly a privileged aristocrat. I mean, uh, you know, he, he was descended from uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards. His, his father was a president of Princeton. Uh, he fought uh, courageously in the American Revolution. He was a, he was a, a sort of military hero. He was an outstanding lawyer, one of the really great lawyers of New York. And, you know, in that capacity, he and Alexander Hamilton crossed swords, and he was probably the one lawyer in New York that could hold his own with Hamilton, which is saying quite a bit. Um, and he was also President Jefferson's vice president. And it was how he became vice president and what he did in that office that ended to that ended in his uh, demise I guess you might say the problem was in that election of 1800 uh, although Jefferson won the election the number of electoral votes in that election was uh, equal between Jefferson who was everybody knew was going to be president and Burr who people understood was to be vice president and both of them got 73 electoral votes so Ordinarily, you would think, well, hey, Burr would have, you know, said, okay, I don't want to be president, we'll let Jefferson be president, but he didn't say that. Uh, what he said, or what he thought, certainly, is that, hey, I'll probably be a better president than Jefferson anyhow. I mean, he was a pretty ambitious, arrogant guy, and so he didn't withdraw. Also, he didn't collaborate with the Federalist Party to, to get him elected, although people accused him of that. What, what did happen, however, because of his refusal to withdraw, was that he incurred Jefferson's lasting hatred and distrust. He felt that Burr's ambition, uh, his lack of character, his essential dishonesty uh, was uh, a damning fault. And I mean, Jefferson, once up he made up his mind, could be very unforgiving, as he was of Aaron Burr. <clears throat> what Jefferson did, the upshot of all this, was essentially to stifle Burr's future in the Republican Party. I mean, uh, and the thing that, of course, climaxed uh, Burr's demise was the fact that he shot Alexander Hamilton in the famous duel uh, in 1804. And so, Burr finds himself an outcast. I mean, this privileged aristocrat, brilliant lawyer, distinguished politician, uh, is a pariah, really. Uh, so what does he do? I mean, he, he does what every young American does that uh, is out of luck in the East, he goes West. And it's his comings and goings in the West that ends him up being charged with treason, and being tried for treason in the circuit court in John Marshall District in 1807. So what did he do? What was he accused of having done? He was accused by Jefferson of, of having attempted to separate uh, the Southwest from the rest of the Union, to attack New Orleans, separate the Southwest, and to also to invade Mexico and set himself up as uh, as king of Mexico, believe it or not, uh, this was treason. The President of the United States, in a special session of Congress in January 1807, announces the fact that his former vice president is a traitor to his country, the argument being that he attempted to separate a part of the country from the rest of the Union, uh, uh, which made him a traitor according to Article Three. But the President of the United States announced his guilt, even though Burr had never been indicted by a grand jury. Obviously, he had never been tried by a jury. And in fact, uh, he had been presented to two grand juries, uh, both of which had refused uh, to bring a bill against him. So the Jeffer Jefferson's attack on Burr looks to be an act of personal, uh, a personal vendetta. Uh, well, so the case is brought, uh, believe it or not, before John Marshall in Marshall's Federal Circuit Court in Richmond in 1807. And the charge against Aaron Burr is that he is a traitor 
uh, United States, and of course by federal statute, traitors are hanged by the neck until they're dead. And uh, so it's a, it's a remarkable a collision of, I guess you might say, distinguished, remarkable characters from, from the early republic. And here you got Jefferson, who is a respected president, uh, a reigning hero to, to, to many people. You've got Aaron Burr, who, by the way, was an excellent vice president. He performed his duties uh, uh, perfectly, according to everybody. Uh, and who, you know, should have been treated differently. After all, Burr really did deliver the presidency to Jefferson in his uh, organization of New York uh, uh, Democrats. And so, uh, to find Burr in the docks, so to speak, for his life, and of course the, the, the final uh, thing which makes the Burr trial one of the great criminal trials really in American history, is that Burr is being tried before John Marshall, Chief Justice of the United States, but Marshall is sitting as a circuit court judge. And remember, in those days, Supreme Court justices rode circuit. That is to say, they were trial judges. That is to say, they dealt with lawyers. They dealt with issues on the ground. Uh, they had to deal with juries, unlike the modern court, which is uh, strictly and uniquely appellate court. So John Marshall is sitting as a, as a trial judge in a case which involves Thomas Jefferson as the, really the chief prosecutor in the case. He's out to get Burr. And Burr himself, who is a well-known character, not a great friend of Marshall's, but somebody that Marshall, uh, after all, a, military, uh, a fellow military officer, which counted for a great deal in those days. Uh, so it's truly a dramatic moment. What makes it even more interesting as an intellectual uh, event and, and as a legal event uh, is the fact that some of the greatest lawyers in the country were arguing the case. I mean, it, William Wirt was arguing uh, for the prosecution uh, as a lawyer, and uh, uh, certainly he was one of the great uh, forensic jury lawyers of all times. On the other side uh, were a, another group of distinguished Virginia lawyers. Uh, so. And, and a, a lawyer by the name of Luther Martin, who was a fantastic uh, jury lawyer as well. Um, so, I mean, it, it was a remarkable uh, legal happening, I guess you might say, with all these important personalities uh, doing their thing. Great arguments were made on both sides of the question uh, about, and of course the real question was, uh, what was treason? Because treason, although it's stated in, in Article Three of the Constitution, is never defined uh, clearly. I mean, Article Three says that treason shall consist of levying war against the United States or giving aid and comfort uh, to their enemies. But uh, what exactly does that mean? What does levying war mean? And what evidentiary standards are necessary to prove this case? What the Constitution does say is that treason shall be uh, upon confession in open court or according to two witnesses to the same overt act, which is a very extremely high level uh, of proof. Well, what happens in this, in this case? I mean, it goes on for three months in a heated uh, you know, Richmond courtroom, which becomes a kind of a it's a, it's a Virginia court day writ large. People come into town, uh, they're betting the ponies, they're down drinking. Andrew Jackson is holding force on, on the uh, you know, proclaiming Burr's innocence. And Aaron Burr is free on bail, believe it or not. I mean, he's walking around the streets of Richmond, uh, or at least for a while, he was walking around the streets of Richmond. He brought to Richmond, by the way, he brought his lovely daughter, Theodosia, uh, and Theodosia is, in a sense, vouching for the innocence of her father, whom she dearly loved. So the, the, the drama, I guess you couldn't say, uh, the, the, the theater involved, the legal theater involved, was extreme. The pressure on John Marshall, however, was, was also extreme. 
Uh, everybody knew, of course, of the hatred between President President Jefferson and and the Chief Justice, uh, and everybody also understood that Jefferson was personally involved in the prosecution of the case, which is, I think is a is a remarkable, uh, unique example of executive interference in 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 the judicial process. Uh, even modern examples of presidents who want to manipulate the court uh, don't approach what, what Jefferson did. What he did was to micromanage the prosecution of the case from the White House. I mean, he told George Hay, who was the federal attorney uh, prosecuting the case, he informed Hay of how to interrogate witnesses, how to, how to conduct the trial, basically. He also sent a, a list of blank pardons, which he said to Hay, that these were to be used to uh, elicit testimony against Aaron Burr. I mean, it, it was an intrusion into the uh, conduct of a trial that, that truly was unusual. But what it did, of course, as people knew, as the papers knew, was to pit the President of the United States against the Chief Justice. And my, mind you, this is a continuation, I think it's properly understood to be a continuation of Marbury versus Madison. It was part of this ongoing war between these two great men, uh, which was one of the defining character, characteristics of this early period. And I, I think if, if you look at it, it's this hatred that Marshall was able to turn into an institutional victory for the court. Uh, although it was not a final victory, it was a remarkable uh, feat of, I guess you might say, judicial politics. The outcome of the case was, although it was clouded by uh, a lot of factors, uh, Burr was acquitted of the charge of treason when the jury rendered its verdict. And in the, in the process, Marshall was able to define treason in Article Three, in the strict sense of the word. And what he did, which was conclusive, was to repudiate the, what we call the doctrine of constructive treason, which the English doctrine of constructive treason, which said that in treason all are principles. Uh, if you're remotely connected to a, this treasonable uh, project, you, you are guilty of treason. Uh, Marshall refused to introduce that doctrine into the case, repudiated it outright, defined levying of war in a, in a, in a narrow sense. And, and what he did was to put the doctrine of treason beyond the reach of, of politics. It was part of, the, part of Marshall's genius, again, of separating law and politics. And he did so in defining this, this important constitutional principle of treason. Um, you know, in the course of the trial, under pressure, Marshall delivered a number of 15 different rulings, on-the-spot rulings, uh, involving complicated legal questions. One of the things I think that's so important about the Byrd trial is we see Marshall in action, really, as a legal scholar. I mean, on-the-spot thinking, I mean, this was his forte, of course. Uh, as people recognize, but the pressure on him, the, the political press was uh, uh, after him. Jefferson wanted to use Marshall's behavior in this trial as the grounds for impeaching him. I mean, despite all this, Marshall keeps his cool, keeps the two, the two sides, the legal sides under control, keeps them focused on the case, makes 15 on-the-spot rulings that demonstrate his uh, incredible command of common law principles of evidence. Uh, it's another example, by the way, again, of the importance of the common law in constitutional interpretation. This whole body of, of private law, which we inherited from England, which governed property relationships between individuals, became the source of constitutional interpretation. And one of the things which makes Marshall such a, a, a legal genius is he, uh, he was the fact that he was a superb common lawyer. And 
The common lawyers are used to interpreting the written text. That's what they do. Whether it's a contract or a will, or whatever, they have a tradition of interpretation, uh, which is well established, you know, several decades, in fact, of judicial rules of interpretation. What Marshall did, and the Burr tr trial illustrates this, and so, by the way, uh, does Marbury, and so do the other great decisions. What Marshall did was to take these rules of interpretation and apply them to a written constitution. What that does is to elevate his decisions into the realm of law, take them out of the realm of politics. If there is a traditional, a tradition of interpretation, which goes beyond the personal uh, inclinations and prejudices of judges, then by exercising judicial power according to the rules of interpretation, Marshall was able to establish the fact that he was not just making the stuff up, that he in fact was ruling according to the rule of law. That was his point, to make the Supreme Court of the United States a, an instrument of legal interpretation. And even though, I mean, it's pretty clear that he behaved politically uh, to avoid disaster, to avoid getting himself impeached for one thing, uh, he used politics and, and political manipulation perhaps to get to the legal issues, as he did in Marbury versus Madison. But when he got to those issues, when he got to the legal issues, he handled them in a magnificent way. Uh, his, it was what one scholar, Carl Llewellyn, once referred to as the grand style of interpretation, which is to say, Marshall was able to justify his decisions by an interpretive, uh, well-established interpretive tradition, uh, which put the court in a special category. And again, uh, the Burr trial, believe it or not, is another example of Marshall's ability to establish and determine the meaning of separation of powers. Uh, th there was just one kind of interesting point, which is sort of relevant to the modern period in this uh, case. At one point in the trial, in Judy, June in this trial, Aaron Burr, who was one of his, the best lawyer on his own side, Baron Burr asked uh, John Marshall for a uh, order from the court uh, and a, a subpoena, subpoena ducus tecum, as the lawyers say, and he said, look, I need, Burr said to Marshall, I need to, to see this key piece of evidence that Jefferson used to bring his charge of treason. I need it for my defense, which is, of course, uh, a justifiable argument for any defense lawyer. And Burr said to Marshall, hey, look, uh, I want you to order the President of the United States to deliver this piece of paper in your possession, a subpoena ducus tecum, order from the court to the President of the United States, another, it looked like another case, it looked like Marbury again, that it was bound to be a loser. But it was, a, it was an interesting standoff. Marshall, in fact, did issue the, the subpoena, and Jefferson did, after some opposition, deliver the paper. He did not, of course, appear in person, which, I mean, there was a big argument at the time. But in a sense, uh, this was a big victory, not only for Burr, but for Marshall and the judicial process, because it proved one thing, that the President of the United States is not above the law, and Jefferson himself conceded that point when he delivered the papers. I mean, they, they shouldn't have hated one another. I mean, they were both descended from the Randolphs of Turkey Hill. Everybody in Virginia seems to be descended from the Randolphs of Turkey Hill. But they were, which is to say, they were both elite, uh, they were both privileged, uh, uh, they were cousins, uh, to be sure. Um, they were both planters, they were both slaveholders. I mean, hey, they were both Virginians. I mean, how do you explain it? 
maybe there's a chemical disaffinity. I don't know whether you can explain this by genetics. Uh, certainly they were different types. I mean, Marshall was more of a frontiersman. I mean, he was born on the frontier. Uh, the front, even though he was a leading conservative, the frontier made him also, a, personally made him a Democrat. Uh, Jefferson, who championed democracy, wasn't personally a, a, a Democrat. I mean, in his personal demeanor. Je you know, Marshall, Marshall was. I mean, for example, uh, there was a famous club in Richmond called the Coit Club. And Coit was a kind of form of, 18th century form of horseshoes. You pitched the Coit to a peg, and the person who got the, their Coit closest to the peg. Marshall loved this. I mean, he had a few uh, mint juleps along the way, which he was famous for. As a matter of fact, I think we have his recipe for mint juleps. I think Chuck Hobson has this someplace in the records. Uh, Marshall loved the camaraderie uh, of the Coit Club. And in contested throws, you find the Chief Justice of the United States. He's down in all fours with a straw, measuring the distance of the Coit from the peg. So I'm asking you, would you find Thomas Jefferson doing this? Would you find George Washington doing it? Would you find John Adams doing it? Would you find Alexander Hamilton doing it? I don't think so. I guess what I'm saying is that it was this democratic down-home quality that I think Marshall maybe imbued from his frontier experience that, that distinguished these two men. You know, you can, you can you can illustrate their differences architecturally, I believe. It's the difference between Marshall's home in Richmond, which was in a federal style home, extremely plain, uh, modest, simple home really, uh, comfortable but far from eloquent. Look at this as against uh, Jefferson's mon magnificent Monticello, which was a work of art really, uh, a work of genius in fact, and, but it's the difference, in a sense, bet between, the, between the two men. There was one other thing, I think, that separates these two great men. And the fact is that Marshall was a, served in the Revolution. He was a soldier. Uh, he fought in the battles. He was at Valley Forge with his men. And Jefferson was not a soldier. I mean, in that day and age, it counted for a great deal. And it certainly counted, I think, in Marshall's uh, estimation. I mean, Marshall, Marshall's great hero was Washington. Washington, the military leader, Washington, the, the next door neighbor, uh, Washington's character. He wrote a letter to his friend uh, uh, Monroe. Marshall did in 1780, said that, George Washington is the greatest man on earth. You know, Thomas Jefferson would never have said that. Well, to what's this add up to these, these differences? Well, I mean, I think the final distinction between the two men perhaps is hard to explain, but it is intellectual and ideological. I mean, Marshall, because he fought in the revolution, thought that he had created a nation Maybe he learned his nationalism at Valley Forge. I mean, Albert Beveridge, the great Marshall biographer, said that, and probably is true. Jefferson did not believe in nationalism. He believed in the American nation, but he believed it was a nation of states. He believed that democratic government could best re be realized at the local level, so he, he distrusted you know, here's a guy who believed in the people, but he distrusted the people that the people elected to go to Congress. Uh, there's, there's an irony there. But, I mean, the fact is that uh, ideologically, personally, uh, Jefferson came to champion a local government uh, as the only true form of democratic government. Uh, state government, and even beyond that, local government. Marshall championed uh, and believed in the fact that the American people who created the nation, 
created the Constitution, could be trusted to do what was best for the American people collectively. It was this fundamental political difference, of course, that ultimately translated into the political party system in the early period. In the 1790s, uh, uh, Jefferson Party, of course, as everybody knows, was uh, based upon states' rights and local government, a distrust uh, of the national government. And Jefferson's view of the Constitution, of course, was that it was a limiting document. It was designed to limit the power of the federal government. Marshall took the opposite position. He believed in the capacity of elected officials to do what was best for the collective interests of the whole people. And he believed, Marshall believed, that the Constitution uh, was a grant of power, not a limitation on it. I mean, this was, as it turns out, was where their personalities uh, may be translated into a, a conflicting political ideology. Uh, but it's, it set the course, really, of, uh, of antebellum constitutional history and, and antebellum political history. And interestingly enough, it was Marshall's decisions uh, in Marbury and in the Burr Treason trial, and particularly in cases like McCulloch versus Maryland, that convinced Jefferson and the states' rights people that Marshall and the Supreme Court was the ad advance guard of, a, of an aristocracy that was, if not corrected and curbed, would destroy American democracy. And this is the, uh, this is the shootout which determines so much of antebellum history. And those two men uh, came to symbolize it. Well, the issue was whether Congress could charter a Bank of the United States. I mean, you might say, well, how could it be an issue because Congress had already chartered the Bank of the United States. Hamilton's Bank of the United States, chartered by Congress in 1791, had run for 20 years uh, and uh, had done a lot of good, according to, to a lot of people. But the charter expired, the 20-year charter expired, and the question was, well, should it be rechartered? And so there was this huge debate. The Bank of the United States is rechartered again over, over considerable opposition. And the first, pre the first president of the second Bank of the United States, William Jones, uh, did what was not supposed to be done. That is to say, in, he encouraged the Bank of the United States to engage in speculative activities Rather than curbing the state banks, keeping their stroke, uh, note issues solid and negotiable, uh, he, in a sense, encouraged speculation. Uh, and when the Bank of the United States called in its bank notes, as it did in the Depression, uh, it brought many state banks down. And of course, when it brought the state banks down, it advertised its own extreme power the fact is that the Second Bank of the United States uh, was a tremendously powerful institution. It was a national institution, of course, which on the very face of it challenged uh, the Jeffers Jeffersonians' preference for local government. And so when the Bank of the United States brought down state banks, it seemed a perfect illustration uh, of the dangers of, of the Bank of the United States. Well, this not surprisingly, translated into a legal constitutional issue. And so those people who were Jeffersonians and states' rights people who were opposed to the Second Bank of the United States said, look, the bank has no right to be in the first place. No place in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution does it give Congress the power to, you know, to charter a Bank of the United States. And this was the issue which was presented in the case of McCulloch versus Maryland. Does Congress have the power to charter a bank when that power is not listed specifically, explicitly, in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, which is the part of the Constitution which defines congressional authority? So th this, this is the issue. It's argued brilliantly uh, on both sides. Uh, in that case, what Marshall did was to uphold the constitutionality of the 
Second Bank of the United States by reference to uh, the 18th clause of Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, which said that Congress, in addition to the specifically listed powers, has all the powers necessary and proper for the execution of the foregoing powers. Whoa. Well, what does that mean? Implied powers to, it looks like, it looked to Jefferson and the states' rights people like this was a blank check. Uh, when Marshall said that necessary and proper is sufficient justification for upholding the Bank of the United States, because the Bank of the United States, even though it's not specifically listed as one of the enumerated powers, the bank functions as an important element in making the other powers, or the other granted powers, possible. It provides a uniform currency with all sorts of ramifications for the other specific powers. And since the Bank of the United States, since a bank is not specifically prohibited by the Constitution, and since it doesn't uh, contradict the spirit of the Constitution, and since there is an indirect connection between uh, the bank and the enumerated powers, Marshall said, the bank is constitutional. What he did uh, by ruling on the bank's constitutionality was to enlarge tremendously the powers of Congress operating through the doctrine, as, as every schoolboy knows, of implied powers. Uh, it it uh, was probably the most important grant of power to Congress that has ever been given, other than the Constitution in Article one Section 8 itself. Uh, and of course, as you might expect, uh, it was the source of a counter-revolution among the states' rights forces in Virginia and across the nation. So what Marshall hoped to do was to expand the authority of the federal government. Ironically, what he did was to give his enemies a reason for attacking not just the Bank of the United States, which of course they did, but attacking the whole interpretive authority of the Supreme Court again. So, in a way, McCulloch is another chapter in this running war, this running constitutional shootout between Jefferson uh, and Marshall. Marshall won it, you might say, in his decision in McCulloch because he granted the constitutionality of the bank, but ironically, he armed his enemies with a great argument against him. And ultimately, of course, uh, with the election of Andrew Jackson, who was a Jeffersonian, uh, I mean, the fate of the Second Bank of the United States was probably sealed, and also the authority of the Supreme Court was put in jeopardy. So Marshall seems to win the big one, but in a way, uh, he paves the way for his own, perhaps not defeat, but his own... Uh, uh, he, he, give, he gives the Jeffersonians a case for diminishing the authority of the court, which he worked his whole life to build. I mean, that's a, another story perhaps we can get to later in the Cherokee Indian cases, but uh, uh, the legacy, of course, of McCulloch is, is huge. Every time in American history, when Congress needs a constitutional foundation for an act which it's about to make, uh, it turns to one of two things. It's either Marshall's interpretation of the Commerce Clause in Gibbons or to his interpretation of implied powers in McCulloch versus Maryland. And certainly McCulloch versus Maryland is one of the most cited cases in Constitution. It's cited by the Supreme Court literally thousands of times. And of course, this is true of Marshall's other great opinions, but McCulloch is right at the top, I think, of Marshall's great nationalist opinions, even though in the final analysis, uh, it doesn't settle all the questions, even though Marshall hoped it would. If you look at Marshall's opinions, uh, take them collectively, I think, it, which is the way you have to do. I mean, those, those decisions of his that created the authority of the court to rule on the Constitution, and then how he used that authority. Uh, how he used that authority, of course, was to interpret the Constitution uh, to increase the powers of the federal government at the expense of the states.
McCulloch, of course, was one of the great foundational decisions in this consolidation of national power. I think the other great one was the case of Gibbons versus Ogden. And it had to do with the meaning of, of the Commerce Clause. Article 1, Section 8 gives Congress the power to regulate commerce uh, among the states and with the Indian nations. Well, so what does that mean? Uh, commerce? What, what is commerce? Uh, strangely enough, the case came up in 1824, and what brought the case to, to the court was a, a collision between state mercantilism, that is to say, state economic policy designed to further the interests of the state, and national economic policy, that is to say, those people who were interested in creating a national market. And what, what generated the case was the fact, an act of the New York legislature which gave a steamboat interest, the Livingston Fulton steamboat interest, a monopoly on steamboat traffic uh, in the coastal waters of New York and in the waters between New York and New Jersey. Um, Gibbons, however, was a rival steamboat company who insisted that this monopoly was not only unwise economically, but it was unconstitutional. How can a state issue a, uh, a monopoly which controls interstate commerce, which of course steamboat traffic between New York and New Jersey, and in the coastal waters of New York? I mean, that, that looks like to me, looks like to, to, to people at that time, was clearly a matter of national authority. So you have a collision between a state act, the act of granting the monopoly in the first place, and the interests of a rival steamboat company that is claiming authority to navigate their steamboats under a federal law. What was that federal law? The federal law was a Federal Coastal Licensing Act passed back in 1793. Okay. It, it was a coast which simply required people, steamboat operators plying interstate waters to take out a federal license. So the question was, uh, ultimately the question was, uh, does the Constitution prohibit this grant of power to Congress to regulate interstate commerce? Does it prohibit acts like the monopoly granted the Livingston Fulton steamboat interests? Well, believe it or not, the commerce power, which is the most, one of the most important powers ever granted to the federal government had never been interpreted by the court or any court until 1824. So what Marshall gets to do in this case, which by the way, he gets to do in all these other cases, he, it's the case of first instance interpretation. He is the first generation interpreter. What a huge uh, advantage to somebody who wants to shape the meaning of the Constitution. Marshall doesn't have to work his way through previous precedents, as modern courts do. He gets to make the precedents. Uh, and given his capacity to expand on the, and to justify his rulings, it's, it's an opportunity to issue judicial state papers on the meaning of the Constitution for the first time. It means that he, for the first time, gets to say, you know, what the meaning of implied powers is, what the meaning of, you know, s section uh, one, you know, clause 18 of, of article one, section eight is. He gets to say for the first time what the meaning of the Commerce Clause is. So what Marshall does in Gibbons, which makes it one of the great foundation blocks, again, of the national market system, which it was, Oh, was to define commerce in an extremely broad way. It's intercourse between the states. It, it's a definition, for example, which is so broad that it, it can be applied in the modern age to give Congress the power to regulate the internet, to regulate radio waves, to, uh, to regulate almost anything, if you can bring it within the compass of Marshall's definition of commerce. And commerce, by the way, Marshall said in his definition, penetrates the states. Interstate commerce doesn't stop at state boundaries. So if the interstate commerce in question goes into the state, it means that so does federal 
interpretive authority. It's a huge grant of authority, in other words, uh, via the Constitution uh, to Congress. Well, interesting thing about it, by the way, this is the last great nationalist opinion of Marshall's because the forces of states' rights opposition are, are, are gathering in, in the mid-1820s in a very serious way. So Marshall gets one last uh, victory. And interestingly enough, it's a victory which even his enemies really can't dispute. Because why? Because Jefferson and the states' rights people uh, Democrats that they are hated monopolies. Monopolies were not democratic. You know, when you've got a, a, a legislature that can favor a certain group, what Marshall did, of course, in Gibbons, was to destroy a monopoly created by a state law. Uh, that act, first of all, liberated commerce, put it under the control of Congress, but it also eliminated a monopoly which seemed to challenge free enterprise. And uh, it goes back to Marshall's theory of capitalism, which underlies all of these decisions, really. He believed in uh, the capacity of the individual to deploy his own property, property, by the way, which is protected by law, to use it constructively, creatively, and to, uh, to generate a, a kind of energy which would bind the nation together, because he felt that the, mar the national market system, which he created, uh, and the uh, property decisions, which he felt uh, support the national market system, uh, were the source of constitutional union. In other words, he, he did not believe, Marshall did not believe that simply because the court said that there shall be a nation, or that the Constitution said that, what he really believed is the source of national unity came in the mutual self-interest of the various sections of the country. And what he saw when he created a national market system was a way of consolidating self-interest across sectional lines. Uh, the ultimate test of his nationalism then was to preserve this, this uh, mutually advantageous uh, uh, arrangement, which, by the way, uh, brings us to another aspect of Marshall's decision, that is to say, his decision not to challenge slavery, that is to say, to preserve slavery as a fundamental economic interest, a property interest, really, of half the country, or more than half. Because as we now know, Southern slavery was the source of economic expansion in the New England textile industry. There was a, a intersectional cooperation based upon slavery uh, that Marshall, even though he didn't rule directly on slavery, that he, he endorsed. The Antelope case uh, brought Marshall and the court head to head with the legality of the international slave trade. What happened is that an American cruiser uh, intercepted a slaver uh, off the coast of Florida, brought it for adjudication into a Georgia federal court. On board were s several hundred uh, slaves, and those slaves were claimed by uh, owners in Portugal and Spain. There were a few slaves that were not claimed by either of those powers. Um, so th the vice council of Spain and Portugal went into federal court to insist that the court uh, return slaves that were in possession uh, of the American government. So the question before Marshall in the Antelope case was whether the international slave trade was constitutional. I mean, that question was bound to come up because, of course, Spain and Portugal were claiming uh, under the legality of international slave trade. The argument in the case, the passionate argument in the case, uh, was that the international slave trade, in fact, was illegal. And there were, there were arguments that could be made and were made. There were moral arguments that were insisted on passionately by, by counsel uh, 
uh, and there, there was a lower federal court case that would have provided Marshall an opportunity, perhaps, to declare that the international slave trade was, in fact, uh, illegal and therefore not enforceable in American courts. I mean, that case was a federal circuit court decision called Lachan, Eugenie. It, it was a case decided on circuit in Massachusetts in 1822 by uh, Marshall's favorite guy on the court, Justice Joseph Story. And the question was, uh, had the inter international slave trade been uh, declared unconstitutional by a collective action of the nations of the Western world. How could Story argue that? Because there was never a convention where all the relevant nations got together and declared uh, that the slave trade was illegal. What Story did was to say, well, look, there are actions, individual actions of various nations, individual actions of various conferences which had met with various nations. He patched together, in his circuit opinion, the argument was that there was enough evidence that the civilized nations of the world, as he liked to say, had decided to end the international slave trade, which everybody, including Marshall, uh, insisted that was the worst uh, injustice there could possibly be. Marshall, therefore, had a moral argument as, at his disposal, one which should have appealed to him because, of course, he saw the immorality of, of the, the international slave trade, the, the cruelest, most inhumane form of human suffering you can imagine. Uh, he had arguments from a moral Christian that were point of view, which were insisted on by counsel. He had story circuit opinion in La Jeanne Eugenie. Uh, if he had chose, if he had chosen, he might have fashioned an opinion which declared international slave trade unconstitutional. It would have been, you might say, it would have been an extension uh, of judicial authority, but people said, hey, look, Marshall extended judicial authority in a lot of cases. I mean, he was a genius at extending judicial authority. Why not extend it in behalf of humanity? He didn't do it. I mean, he, he said, well, I'm against the slave trade. Everybody's against the slave trade. But the law is the law. This is a legal institution, the Supreme Court. This is his whole point. The Supreme Court has always followed the law. It's bound by the law. That's what distinguishes it from the other branches. And he's sticking to it. What he said is, uh, e even though there's a moral argument, so that doesn't control a court of law. So he, he gave a, a, a decision which upheld uh, the international slave trade. Uh, something else happened, which makes the Antelope case particularly kind of a reprehensible, a dark moment. What are you going to do with those slaves those Africans on board this ship that neither Spain owners nor Portuguese owners can claim. How do you know which of the two or three hundred slaves are free, which are slaves? You know how they decided them? By lot. I mean, just stop and figure. I mean, human beings, fate, freedom descended by you know, who draws a piece of paper out of the hat? I mean, it, it uh, I guess you might have to say it, it really was a dark moment. I mean, you can understand it's consistent with Marshall's jurisprudence, but it also uh, calls attention to an element in Marshall's jurisprudence, which is not so pretty. That is to say, his determination to uh, rule on the side of slavery when there's a choice. Marshall really was, was a Southerner. He was a serious slaveholder. Does this bias him? Does this explain this? What explains it? I mean, I don't know. What explains human behavior? Uh, it's one of the ironies, isn't it? That the great nationalist was a Southerner, and on this point, he was a states writer. At issue in the, in the Cherokee cases was the fate of the Cherokee Indian nation,
that occupied the northwest corner of Georgia. Um, the Cherokees were a remarkable uh, people. Uh, thanks to some of the legislation passed in the 1820s, they had begun to, what to say, civilize themselves. They had a constitution, they had a written language, uh, uh, they were uh, serious agriculturalists. They were doing, it would appear, what uh, American politicians wanted them to do, which was cease to be an Indian, right? Not everybody in the Cherokee Nation, of course, agreed to this uh, amalgamation policy. But it didn't make any difference to the Georgians because what the Georgians discovered was that million or so acres in the northwest part of Georgia was very valuable land, and especially when gold was discovered on it. Uh, I mean, it was land greed and gold greed, and, and <clears throat> the people in Georgia simply wanted to take the Cherokee lands, and they passed laws in 1828 saying that, declaring uh, that the state had jurisdiction over Cherokee land. What happened, of course, was uh, when Andrew Jackson was elected president, he agreed. I mean, he, he was a states' rights guy. He didn't like Indians. He was a fairly notorious uh, Indian fighter himself, didn't, mi didn't mind uh, eliminating men, women, and children in Indian villages. I mean, it was pretty vicious uh, kind of action on his part. And he favored the Georgians. And uh, since his party controlled Congress in 1830, they passed a law uh, authorizing uh, the removal of the Cherokees from their land. And so this was ultimately the issue as to, as to whether a, a state backed by the President of the United States could declare jurisdiction over land belonging to the Cherokees, belonging by virtue of a series of federal treaties. Uh, so it was a question again of state law, of the state law you know, confiscating, declaring jurisdiction, state jurisdiction over Cherokee land, and federal treaty law, which apparently granted the Cherokees the right of occupancy for those lands. So again, it was a state law versus a federal law. Uh, typical of this whole shootout between the states' rights people and, and Marshall's nationalists in the 1820s. So this ongoing war, which was started by McCulloch versus Maryland and carried on in various ways in the 1820s sort of comes to a climax. Uh, and of course, here you've got a president who controls Congress, uh, who's already taken a stand in favor of Georgia's actions against a, the Supreme Court, which now has some very decided Jacksonians on it. So, I mean, the importance of the issue from the standpoint of the Cherokees is, is immense, but so is the importance of the issue in regard to the authority of the Supreme Court and also to the reputation of Marshall. And then you say, well, why is it, I mean, this makes it a great case. What makes it his finest hour? Uh, you know, Marshall was an old timer by this time. You know, he died in 1835. Uh, two or three years after these cases. He was not well. The, the gallstone issue, his health issue was, was bad. Uh, his wife had just died in December of 1831, which crushed him. Um, and to some extent, he was losing his physical vitality. Um, people saw him going to court on a cold March day without a hat on, with his coat flapping in the breeze. Here's this old guy, uh, seems to be impervious to it. William Wirt, by the way, who, who was one of the great lawyers of the time and who actually loved Marshall dearly, uh, saw Marshall in court and he write, William Wirt writes to a friend of his, he said, uh, the great man appeared in court today. He had uh, egg on his uh, chin, and then he said, what a sloven the great man is. So here's, it. here's Marshall in his final stage, you know. He's hurting bad physically. His wife has just died. His enemies have gathered around him. Uh, the president uh, 
and Congress have uh, thrown down the gauntlet. And so this is what he's faced in the, in the Cherokee cases. What does he do? Well, it's a pretty amazing act of political dexterity in the interest of judicial justice, I would say. So here's the way the litigation went very briefly. Uh, in the first Cherokee case, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, the Cherokees hire, among other lawyers, William Work and John Sargent, by the way, who's the chief lawyer for the Bank of the United States. But Wirt, Wirt is a, a brilliant lawyer, and he's the lead counsel for the Cherokee Indians. So what does he do? He's, he's faced with these difficulties, and so he brings a case directly to the Supreme Court under original jurisdiction. And what Wirt argues to get original jurisdiction in the case is that uh, the Cherokees were a foreign nation. I mean, they had been called a nation, an Indian nation, this and that, and there's some argument. And uh, I mean, he, he has a moral component to his argument, where it does too, but if it's a foreign nation, then according to original jurisdiction in Article Three, uh, you can bring a case directly to the Supreme Court. And that makes sense because a foreign nation would not want to start its litigation in the municipal courts of uh, Washington, D.C. You go directly to the Supreme Court. The question was, however, what were the Cherokee Indians really a foreign nation capable of bringing an original jurisdiction case? I mean, that's a, that's a far reach. I mean, I think we knew it was a far reach, perhaps, but that's what he... That's what he had at his hand, and that's what he used. And so Marshall confronts this rather extreme argument in the first Cherokee case. And what Marshall finally says is, no, they, they, they are not. We can't say they are not. They were not a foreign nation. And therefore, uh, the, the court has no jurisdiction because it, they can't bring an original jurisdiction case. And you would say, well, hey, that's the end of it. But it was not the end of it. Because Marshall, it's a tremendous act of ingenuity, I guess you might say, of, of judicial hubris, I guess, if you were on that side of it. But in addition to denying the case, he also takes occasion to say, well, look, if that case were brought under proper jurisdiction, then the court would be sympathetic. I mean, he addresses the merits of the case to a case he says a court has no jurisdiction in, but if it were to be found under proper jurisdiction, then the, he seemed to be saying the court would be very sympathetic to the plight of the Cherokee Indians. Whoa! I mean, he's, he's already antagonized uh, all the states' rights people in the country by, by taking that, uh, that line of, of activity. He did more than that, however. He encouraged Justice Thompson, with the support of Joseph Story, to issue and print a dissenting opinion uh, in which they make a powerful case for the legality of the Cherokee title to the land under federal treaties. So what Marshall did, first of all, he re, you know, refused jurisdiction. Then he said, well, but if you... If you can find a way to get this court, we're going to like this case. I mean, that's pretty much an act of hubris right there, right? And then he encourages two members of the court to dissent from the decision in order and to print their dissents privately to circulate this. He's mobilizing a case. Uh, and he's doing this, a lot of people say, it's probably true, to get the issue of the Cherokee Indians to the American people in time for the election of 1832. I mean, he wanted, he's not the only guy who wanted Jackson to be defeated, but he, he knew, Marshall knew that his years on the court were limited. His health was bad. He knew he couldn't hang on much longer. Uh, if Jackson could get defeated, if Daniel Webster, perhaps, or William Wirt, uh, or Henry Clay, if they could get elected instead of Jackson, then they would appoint somebody favorable to his position. And, you know, John Marshall had in mind his friend Joseph Story for the position. Story would have been probably superb uh, chief justice. So Marshall is pushing to the limits of politics the way he handles the first Cherokee Indian case. 
Well, as it turns out, I mean, fate intervened. Uh, fate being the fact that uh, a couple of missionaries from New England uh, went into Cherokee territory and continued to preach the word of God in, in defiance of state law. And of course, they were arrested and fined to four years of hard labor by the Gwinnett County Court, all right? And uh, so, here, here, here is the case uh, that Marshall Hope would uh, make its appearance before the Supreme Court because it's a, a case of individual right. Uh, the decision of the Gwinnett County Court can be taken and was taken on what we call a writ of error to the Supreme Court of the United States. It's an individual right now. It's not uh, uh, resting on the idea that the Cherokees were a foreign nation, but the integrity of Georgia's legislation under which the missionaries were convicted and imprisoned was now an issue. And also before the court was the role in which federal treaties play. Because if Wirt and company could argue that federal treaties uh, were supreme over the state law, then the missionaries would be held improperly and uh, uh, the Cherokees would be, in a sense, in possession of their land. And in fact, in the second of the Cherokee Indian cases in Worcester versus Georgia, this is exactly what Marshall did. And in, in a way, I mean, here's this guy. He's literally on his deathbed. He's in pain. Uh, he's, in, he's in considerable misery. His authority on the court has been diminished significantly. Uh, and yet he hands down one of the most extensive and sort of learned uh, opinions of his whole career. What he establishes historically goes back through the history record and points out the fact that the Cherokees have been treated as a political community, first of all by England and by the United States. A po political community, not, not a foreign nation to be sure, but a political community with its own traditions, its own laws, and its own capacity to negotiate treaties with England, which it did, and with the United States of America as well. What Marshall did when he handed down this decision was to call into action a phrase that he had employed in the first Cherokee case in which he referred to the Cherokee Indians as a domestic dependent nation. And when you say, oh, how can it be a nation if it's domestic? and also depend, how can a nation be dependent? Marshall explains this in Worcester versus Georgia. Um, and in doing so, he, he upholds the treaties between Georgia and the United States, which gave the Cherokee Indians the right to occupy their lands in Georgia. Georgia's act of declaring jurisdiction, therefore, contradicted federal law. Federal treaties was unconstitutional according to you know, the supremacy clause of the Constitution. So, against the odds, despite his, his uh, personal uh, bereavement and his ill health, he, he salvages uh, a moral victory. I mean, you might say, well, I mean, after the antelope, yeah, after the freedom suit cases, but this, this is his finest hour, I think, given the odds against him. Unfortunately, however, as, as you know, as everybody knows, it didn't benefit the Cherokees. I mean, uh, uh, because the President of the United States would not enforce this act against Georgia without the President's enforcement. I mean, Marshall's decision came to nothing. There was a, you know, it was, it was once thought that Jackson said, uh, well, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. Actually, I mean, these were famous words that were never spoken, unfortunately, but uh, Jackson didn't say that, but that's what he thought. Even though he, by the way, he liked Marshall, he respected Marshall, but he did not respect this decision, did not enforce it. The Cherokees, in a sense, were forced out of Georgia. They went to their lands in Oklahoma. Uh, a lot of them, men, women, and children, died on the way out. And of course, when they got to Oklahoma, they, they discovered that many of the lands which had been promised to them were already occupied by other Indians. 
I mean, it was it was a tragedy, but but the court did the right thing, uh, and as as Joseph Story said when he looked at the decision, he said, "The court it's done its moral duty," he said. Now let the American people do theirs. Unfortunately, however, the American people didn't feel this, that their moral obligation to protect the Cherokees or to uphold the decision of the court. That is to say, they re-elected Andrew Jackson, who, who then uh, carried out the mission, so to speak, of Indian annihilation. Uh, Marshall came off well, but the people of the United States uh, didn't come off so well in that case. John Marshall was the fourth Chief Justice of the United States. Uh, he occupied that distinguished position from 1801 until his death in 1835. In the course of those years, he consolidated the power of the court. In fact, I would say, more than any other single individual, uh, established the court as an institution. It wasn't, of course, I think, just Marshall's great decisions, certainly not the great decisions. Singly, taken collectively, they established a sort of a gigantic state paper justifying the existence of the Supreme Court of the United States as an independent branch of government. And you know, people like to cite Marbury or McCulloch, uh, as we have to do, but I think something happened that was more important to support this reputation as an institution builder, more important than any of the other cases, more important than Marbury or McCulloch. It was the way the court did business. What Marshall did, and by the way, you can see evidence of it, first of all, in Marbury versus Madison, what Marshall did was to abandon the practice of seriatim opinions, that is to say, the, the practice which was uh, uh, customary to English courts and to colonial courts and to most federal courts, really, in the 1790s, where judges on the court issued separate opinions, seriatim opinions. Stop to think about it. Uh, what would Marbury, what would judicial review mean if every judge on the court could issue an opinion as to the meaning of the Constitution? I mean, there, it would lack force. I mean, there would be no clear argument. Uh, there would be nothing that could really be cited as dispositive. What Marshall did was to persuade his colleagues to have a single opinion of the whole court. What he did also was to persuade his colleagues to let him write most of the important opinions. I mean, 24 of the first six, 26 opinions from 1801 to 1805, 24 of 26 were written by John Marshall. A huge proportion of all of the Almost all of the important cases uh, were written by, by John Marshall. But the court could speak with authority because it spoke in a single voice. And Marshall was able to do this because of his personality, because the judges lived and boarded together as a, as a team, you might say, when they, when they went to Washington. And so he was able to in, influence uh, his, uh, his colleagues to abandon uh, separate opinions in favor of a single majority opinion. That was absolutely essential to the court's history, I'd say. I think he would be surprised by the fact that there are no, that judges on the Supreme Court are no longer trial judges. I think the fact that early Supreme Court judges, Marshall included, had to ride circuit, and they in fact spent more time riding circuit than they did uh, sitting as an appellate court in Washington. But that was an extremely important, uh, hugely important uh, provision of the judiciary, early Judiciary Act. What it did, of course, was bring the authority of the federal court down to the people. When judges rode the circuit, when they decided cases of a local nature, when they, when they faced juries, when they dealt with lawyers arguing substantive cases, they got a feeling for they became really, judges became, because of the circuit, representative figures in the American political system in a, in a direct, almost democratic way. I think he was profoundly right. I mean, our system is based on separation of powers. I think, I mean, there are two things that prevent injustice in our system. 
One of the things is separation of powers. The other is, of course, the federal arrangement, where it's, where it's contested power between the states and the central government. But except for Marshall's uh, contribution to the emergence of the court as a separate branch of the government, I think the principle of separation of powers would have not come into being, really. Uh, if Marshall had allowed himself to be impeached uh, in Marbury or in McCulloch versus Maryland, if he had not some other played the political game of law, right, he would have gotten impeached, which would have diminished the authority of the court. But without the court, without the federal judiciary as an equal branch of the government, I think we'd be really on the way to some sort of tyranny. Uh, so I, you know, I, I think Marshall's contribution to the separation of powers has got to be one of the, one of his greatest contributions.